Welcome, everyone. Uh, thanks for coming to the session on movement roles. There's, uh, for people who, who don't know, we've been, we, a, a couple of years ago, we started talking about all the different roles in the movement. And at that point, we didn't even have a diagram enumerating what all the roles were. And a number of people at, uh, at, chapters, at chapters meetings, two years running, were, uh, were strongly committed to fixing this. And this turned into a recommendation for a group that would gather together community members, focus on defining what the roles and responsibilities were in the movement, and then figure out which organization should be responsible for which, for which roles in order to make things as smooth as possible. Uh, one, of the, one of our outcomes this year was this beautiful diagram. And, and this is sort of one of those circuits that you can try to simplify. Uh, without without breaking everything, and over the course of movement roles, people identified a few dozen different tasks and responsibilities that weren't clearly uh, that weren't clearly distributed across the foundation chapters and other formal entities, independent volunteer groups, and outside outside groups that we rely on to hold for, to uh, define the standards that we turn to when making decisions. But we ended up coming up with recommendations for a few of the subparts of this diagram. So if you consider that readers, donors, and other groups are number in the hundreds of thousands or the millions, and then authors are in the tens to hundreds of thousands, uh, the WMF and chapters number in the dozens to hundreds of individual people, and then there are a number of entities that, that are explicitly given decision-making roles. Uh, committees, here we have CHAPCOM in the corner because it's sort of it generates committee-like bodies. And then you have you know, audit nominating election, other Wikimedia committees, research and ombudsman groups, the staff themselves. And then uh, tools like OTRS, which again help generate new, new demand for responsibilities. Most of what we've done so far in the first year of movement roles as a, as a working group was to, to come up with recommendations for these entities in the middle, for the foundation itself, for the board, and uh, for these smaller groups, chapters, and, and other formal entities. Vladimir. Yes. And that's like the core of movement, but it's amazing for that diagram. The reason that I point out the fact that authors, readers, and donors are these huge groups compared to the rest is that this is like those maps of New York where you see New York occupying 60% of the world and the rest of the world is like 10, 15% off in the distance. We tackled the part of the movement where we all felt, uh, ang we all felt the pain of overlapping responsibilities. And we recognized that it was an, a much bigger and more interesting task to solve the responsibility questions for the movement as a whole and for the authors. If you just looked in one editing project, you would find hundreds of independent wiki projects, local groups, many of them with their own election and nomination processes, many of which with somewhat competing guidelines. And uh, I'm calling this out because there is a similar process that needs to be had for the projects. That, that isn't what we did. Uh, we, we were resolving the problems that the foundation and chapters were facing in, in trying to negotiate who had to do organizational level tasks. And uh, one of the three groups that, that we'll break out into is just to try and, and describe a few of the issues that might face the community. But we, we, we pushed that off. So um, there's, an, there's an open question to the community whether this was useful enough for there to be a, a similar community process. And this is not meant to be authors pointing to the board, by the way. This is sort of uh, the editing community pointing to formal entities for help. Th that's sort of a, a, a support line, a communication line. Arno, where are you? Oh, hi, sorry. So um, Arna and Bishaka and I were the, uh, the board representatives moving the, the working group work forward. We had a, a large group of people who have all been contributing over the past 
over the past many months. If you see any of these people at Wikimania and you're interested in these topics, feel free to grab one of them and talk to them about their part of the work. Uh, and this is an open working group, so we're interested in, in participation. Uh, everyone here is encouraged to join and to sign up and, and express your interest. We were facilitated by John Huggett, who has done some great background work and produced a couple of white papers for the movement about how other de de decentralized and distributed global projects have organized themselves, primarily how they deal with uh, distribution of power, decision making, and allocating of, re of resources. Those are the areas where there's most often conflict. And so, John, do you want to come up and talk a little bit about your ideas on peer networks and things that we can learn from them? Sure. Uh, I'm John Huggett. Um, I've been working on this for about a year. Um, my other life is working with all their organizations, and I've done a lot of work with international NGOs and have published a couple of pieces on it too. So that was why they asked me to come and help uh, with this work here. So first point is what we're trying to do here is to design an organization for Wikimedia, not copy somebody else's. So most of the work we've been doing is talking internally. So we've done chats on IRC, we've interviewed people, we've put stuff on the wiki, we were at Berlin for the chapters conference, uh, we've tried to build on all the work that's been done. Um, and at the same time, what we would try to do is to work out what are the lessons that you can take from other organizations out there that might be useful learning for us here. Uh, there's over a hundred international NGO movements around the world. They range from the Red Cross, which is huge and may not even be an NGO depending how you define it, uh, through to World Vision, which is about two and a half billion in revenue, down to some very tiny ones that really operate in a number of different countries. Um, all of them face issues in how you coordinate. Uh, there is no simple answer. Um, everyone struggles with it, but a number do quite a good job. So if you look at the ones that do a good job, there's really, I think, you can probably pick out about five key models. And as we looked at these, we thought, which ones are most useful for Wikimedia? Um, if you start with the principle that what we want to do is to be globally coherent, that we can run Wikipedia, and we want to be decentralized, we want to have as much autonomy in each of the little groups as possible, who are the models that might help? Well, strange as it may sound, the one that is probably closest is the Olympics. Now, the Olympics is an organization which isn't always perfect and often criticized, but what it does do is have about a few hundred organizations affiliate, often quite independently, and at the same time, it can run each two years in the Olympic Games. Um, there are organizations out there that are very centralized. Mozilla is a good example, where they make decisions centrally. Americares and so on and so forth are very much like that. They're very effective globally, but they're not decentralized. And that you know, doesn't really fit with what our demand was. You can go the other way and you can say, what we really want to do is to be completely decentralized, be the YMCA. You have a shared brand name, but they're not globally coherent. They can't run a, a program. I mean, the Y, I think we all know, is an organization that is in a number of different countries, it's had a number of different um, incarnations, and there are even songs about it. But it is really a coherent organization. Um, we looked at a couple of other ones. The Red Cross is highly complicated, and it, the people who work there wouldn't recommend their model for anybody else. Um, and the other one we looked at was Médecins Sans Frontières, which is uh, an association of national organizations. And they've grown up over the years, and one of the ironies is that while doing the work here, I've done some work for Médecins Sans Frontières, who very much looks to you as an example of an organization that's actually quite coherent. <laughs> so uh, pulling it all together, we're saying, is it possible to put together a global NGO movement that's really big and can scale and can get much bigger, can remain coherent, and at the same time give lots of autonomy to all the groups that bolt in? Absolutely it is. So somebody else has done it, and there are some lessons in there. Uh, I mean, there's a whole pile of stuff on the wiki. I won't read it all out to you, um, but I've done tons of research. We've got other people doing stuff too. We've linked it to other work, so you can keep digging through it. And if you've got questions, ask us or put questions on the talk page. Um, but if there are sort of three key sort of lessons that are out there, um, w one is to sort of not lose global coherence. Uh, one of the things that a number of organizations really struggle to get to is how can you remain globally coherent while be de being decentralized? It may seem a difficult question. It is a difficult question. People do struggle with it, but people do solve the problem. But in trying to be decentralized, it's not a good idea to lose your global coherence. In the same way, if you're trying to be globally coherent, you don't want to lose all the local autonomy. Um, another one to worry about is what I've called fuzzy accountabilities. Uh, one of the things that's pretty clear with all the organizations, from decentralized to centralized, is they get very sharp on accountabilities. Um, the NGO movement worldwide has a lot of scrutiny on it. 
Um, and as people get fuzzy accountabilities, things start to go wrong. People take a while to make decisions, corruption happens. Um, in any organization, whether it's government, business, or the nonprofit space, if roles are not clear, mistrust builds. Um, if ever I work with an organization where people don't trust each other, one of the things I first try and look to is how clear are the roles. So if I discover, for example, that you know, James is working with Sue and they're not getting on very well, you know, how clear are their roles? And often a lot of the time is that everyone's trying, it's, it's right, everyone's trying to do the right thing, but if we're stepping on each other's toes with the best of intent, then things go wrong. So the second thing was fuzzy accountabilities. And then the final thing was becoming unrepresentative. Uh, all of the NGOs struggle with this. And a number of them have put a lot of effort in in recent years to make sure they remain very representative. So if you take the Olympics, if you look at the International Olympic Committee of about 20, 30 years ago, it was a room full of fairly wealthy white men, mostly from the Northern Hemisphere. Uh, it's now actually a pretty diverse group. There's women there, there's a lot of athletes, um, there's a good representation from developing countries too. And that wasn't by accident, that was a design to make sure that it represented the whole movement. So anyway, that's a quick summary of what's on there. Um, if you're interested in more, there's tons more. I'd be delighted to talk to you about it. Uh, there's lots of research on the wiki, and there's even more stuff if you really want to dig on the material behind it. So what I will do now is to hand back to SJ and to say, take us through the next exercise, because what we've done over the last year is put together what the board asked us to do back in uh, October, which was, first of all, a charter for the movement going forward, and we'd like your help on that. Uh, plus some recommendations, and we've got some recommendations for new models, and we've got some recommendations for the community, and what we would like to do is to get your help in improving what we've got and making it ready for prime time. Thanks, John. Now, Arna, do you want to come up for a minute? So uh, when we started all of this, uh, it, it was it was largely in response to discussions Arna was having with with the chapters. And uh, do you want to just talk for for a minute about the the original motivation, the problems we were trying to we were trying to resolve? Yes. So um, perhaps for those who know don't know me that well, a little bit of background on uh, where I'm coming from in in this movement. I was. Uh, joining Wikipedia in 2003 and uh, was in 2004 one of the founders of Wikimedia Germany, the first chapter that existed uh, ever. So, um, and then became the first employee of that chapter uh, two years later. And then after doing this for two years, I uh, went on and I'm now on the board of, direct, uh, board of trustees uh, as one of the two uh, chapter representatives or chapter selected board members or chapter elected, whatever you want to call it. <laughs> Part of our problem, by the way, that this is not, this is one of those fuzzy things that are floating around for, for ages and um, a small symptom of the underlying uh, issue that we never really sat together in all those years to actually write down what our relationship and our different roles in this, in this movement are because we couldn't. We were still in these early stages experimenting a lot and um, this whole fuzziness was necessary, I think, in the first years because nobody could come up without experience for, with a model that actually helps us all together supporting the uh, project work that was already there before the organization even existed. That puts us into a, uh, or what, did put us into a very fuzzy, but at the same time um, exciting uh, situation of trying to get along with each other, trying to build uh, trust on, on different levels with some um, drawbacks over, over time. And when we became more <coughs> old as a movement, as a whole, and chapters were growing, in different parts of the world, actually looking to those chapters that were already there, trying to do what they did, and some of them finally figured out that it's probably not the best way um, to do it the, in, the, in a similar way because their environment, their actual goals are different from, uh, from those chapters that existed at that time. There was... <coughs> an increasing demand to 
actually become more clear about uh, these different roles and models. And this is, I think, true. I can see that and remember that uh, from several different perspectives, both from the, from the side of the board as well as uh, being a staff member of a chapter, uh, as well as being a, a volunteer um, on, the, on the project. So, yeah, this was the original intent of the, of the movement since we have this vision of being everywhere all over the world and we are now in a in a stage where we are we have i think enough experience and enough yeah confidence to actually talk to each other and enough resources and time to talk to each other and enough people who are committed to this organizational part of the movement to actually sit together and work on this and we need to do it now because if we get bigger and bigger over time and we are still approving new chapters every two weeks or at least one month, <laughs> um, it becomes even more difficult to, to do that. So that was the original intention uh, to uh, start this whole Movement Roads project to become a little more concrete about our relationship and our different roles and probably also exploring new alternatives, new ways uh, to participate in this organizational part of the movement that we didn't come up with yet because we are just focused on our own role and finding our own way in this movement without this bigger scope and this helicopter perspective uh, on this whole thing. Thanks. So th the recommendations that we came up with fell largely into three categories. One were recommendations for the movement as a whole, things that uh, things that everyone should commit to in order for us to understand where we sit in respect in relation to one another. Uh, primarily a movement charter that defines what it is everyone stands for. Something that's more that's more specific and that has more impact on our on our uh, <laughs> daily activities than uh, than the mission and the vision, which are very abstract. And and in order to figure out what sorts of what sorts of goals we wanted to achieve, we sent around a questionnaire. I'll ask everyone here if you if you have a chance to take a look at this. It's uh, movement roles slash feedback on Meta. I would love it if everyone here could answer each of these questions in just a few words. You can create a sub page for yourself and and share it there. And based on that kind of feedback, we organized um, we developed a draft charter and a number of, of surrounding recommendations for what we can all do together. Uh, we'll, we'll get to the specifics of the charter in a minute, but I just wanted to throw it up for people to look at. And it's, you know, it's very short. Uh, the groups and entities share common beliefs, values, vision, and mission are guided by this idea of international cooperation around sharing knowledge, aimed to reach and support communities not currently reached. Um, everyone sets their goals in harmony with movement priorities, but not necessarily directly driven by them. We're committed to multiculturalism and diversity, and we're committed to collaboration on major decisions, making decisions together. These are all things that we've done so far, but it's easy for people to, to worry that maybe they won't always be done that way. The, the charter itself is still a, a draft in progress, but we're hoping to get endorsement from the foundation and from the chapters and most of the other movement entities over the coming month. And related to having a charter itself, having a commitment to accountability and transparency. Again, things that show up in our, in our, in our mission, but things that we haven't articulated um, as something everyone is expected to, to uphold if they want to be, if, if they want to call themselves part of the movement. And then some specific recommendations for acknowledging new models. We had this notion that, uh, that a chapter was the way you organized a group, but there are groups of all, of all kinds. There are lots of small local meetups. There are organizations that are committed to glam work and, and, and outreach that are topically linked that do amazing work and that really would benefit from a formal structure and from uh, a legal framework. And all of these organizations need review processes. And right now, we're, we're, that's one of the I think the big gaps we identified in this discussion. We know, what it, we know what good work is when we see it, but we don't have a review process to figure out what's going well, what isn't going well, that's consistent across the movement. And then a few, a few recommendations came out for the community. We tried really hard not to get into this because there are hundreds of important things that the community needs, but four that came up that, uh, that came up more than once that we figured we had to, that we had to include were setting up some way to resolve hard global requests, uh, 
right now there are about 10 or 12 a year that stewards and other people don't know how to resolve? Yes. In this case, it's a recommendation for the community, and the board will be asked to, to say, this, organ this group should be set up, here's an initial group, as, as we did with various committees. Please go and define the details of how you work and then come back and get them approved. So these are all links. You can see this on the summary recommendations page. The, the global recommend request committee has been up, it's been discussed over the last five or six months, and I think we're getting very close to something that the board could recommend instantiating. That's actually something I would love for the community to be able to say. I'd love it, if, uh, it doesn't seem to me as a, as a trustee that the board should be saying, you should create this community entity. Uh, which is why one of the other recommendations is that there should be some kind of wiki council to develop cross-project policy. Right now, any major controversial policy that affects multiple projects is kicked up to the board. Stewards and, what's that? After many failed attempts, yes. Only seven years later. We're actually attracted by the one thousand volunteers. Absolutely. So that is a fine process. The and I mean I was I was very much involved in, in watching that discussion. No one knew exactly what process to follow. People said, well, you could have an RFC and you could put up a global banner. How long should we put it up? Who gets to decide if the RFC is done? In the end, it, it was successful, but there was a debate among six or seven stewards who were saying, who's gonna close this? It's at 74% acceptance. Are we gonna have to go through the whole process again? Nobody wanted to do it, right? We, we were lucky that one or two people said, I'll do it, and the people yell at me, and they remove my flags, fine. But we can do better. We could, we could, have, we could have an organization asked to take care of those things. So the idea, the idea for a wiki council, I, I just linked to Lodovic and, and other people's recommendation from 2008. Uh, there, there isn't a specific recommendation for this yet in the process. It needs to be developed. As I said, we were trying not to get too much into the weeds here because there are lots of community recommend, uh, proposals that are out there. Um, I strongly, I will strongly encourage everyone I meet to try and make a council like this happen, may, just because we, we know we need one. The next time there's a global, there's a global sysop type request, or something else that requires a major meta RFC, I'd like there to be a group that's as efficient as our elections committee that can say, sure, we'll run one. And but so, I, I mean, let's not, if, if there are other questions, interrupt at any time, but we're about to break out into groups, and so there'll be a group just talking about these com recommendations for the community. Uh, similarly, a, a projects committee to review new and old ideas for projects. I think we now have something like 60 ideas for uh, rec requests for new projects. Uh, that needs to be resolved, even if it's resolved by saying we won't do any of these. And prioritizing better communication outside of English. Again, how that happens, not defined. Lots of people mention this as an abstract problem. And this seems like a problem that affects every, every part of the community. James, uh, very kindly helped facilitate our discussion yesterday. Who is here at the chapter's, at the chapter's talk during Hacking Days? Great. So there's a little discussion about about movement roles and, uh, and the charter itself, and there's a little discussion about financial transparency and accountability. Uh, we're gonna get to both of those. The, the financial accountability and transparency issue was probably the hottest topic yesterday, so we're giving a, a whole section for that uh, at the end of the first hour. And so instead, instead of addressing that, um, I'd like to break out into groups that are interested in the community recommendations groups interested in the recommendations for formal entities, and a group talking about recommendations for all the groups in the movement, and, and essentially about the charter. So, part, that's right. So, are there any general questions? Questions, Kim, was that a, was that a wave of yes? Or were you doing the wave? <laughs> okay. So, is it being discussed It's a it's a discussion to to make comments on the wiki and to, and to post edits, and um, to have each group will have a facilitator who's taking down people's notes and and posting them online during the discussion, and then we'll we'll gather back together for five minutes, actually, you know, three minutes per group to do a wrap up. And uh, our hope for all of these recommendations, our hope is that all these recommendations will be 
will be passed on either to the board uh, as, as a representative of the foundation, to chapters as a group, or to the community as a, as a public letter by, uh, by the end of September. The, 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 ba the bad news, frankly, is that pretty much all of the big NGO networks have had problems with corruption. Um, the IOC has had some pretty bad trouble. The Red Cross has some very bad problems. Um, MSF is pretty good, but they've had their own problems too. So the reality is all the NGO networks have problems. So to find you one that hasn't had a problem with corruption is, isn't, is actually, you're going to... Well, the, 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 yeah, but the, the, they're there, but they're not that good. They're, they're somewhat marginal. So the, the reality is it's a, it's a rot that hits them all. The IOC, I think, has done a good job since it had its problems with you in Salt Lake City um, and sorted a lot of its stuff out. What's the really bad news is that most of these organizations have gone through some hard knocks and have sorted out their accountabilities and made them much, much tighter. Um, and the reality is that the, the Wiki movement is now going through that process now. Now, the good news is, is that Wiki Where movement... Pardon? Where are the hard rocks? Other NGO networks yeah. solve accountability problems after they have hard rocks. Well, so if you need to do that, you need to first have hard rocks hit by hard rocks. Are there any yeah. hard rocks? I, th I think, really yes, I think, I think there are a number of situations within the movement that are accidents waiting to happen. And it would be much better to address them now than have a problem and then try and solve it later. So I think if you look at the other NGO movements, a number of them have waited until too late and had a scandal. I think you have the great opportunity, we do, of, of avoiding it before it happens. Um, the, the one they're closest to is Médecins Sans Frontières. Um, they're, they're a, a pretty good, I mean, I, one of the groups I looked at um, they're a pretty big organization. They're main national organizations which are affiliated, and they have a global group that exchanges resources among themselves. Yeah. Yeah, I know them well. Yeah. Amnesty International is between the other one. Am yeah, Amnesty is somewhere between MSF and, and the Y. It's a very, very loose association. Um, they do have an ability to make some global decisions, but for the most part, decisions are made fairly locally. Uh, they have an annual meeting of about 500 people that gets together. Yeah, yeah. Thanks. Uh, I don't. I am not so sure whether I understood those models well. Because if you think about the IOC, the most striking thing for me, it's well, it's a club uh, with co-optation, mm -hmm. and I wonder, well, what will be the role of the chapters? And I wonder, uh, how will you prevent that? Well, white men will choose white men, or black women, black women, and so on. So all this problem, you say. Uh, it must be open and non-exclusive. Well, it's rather the opposite. And we have seen it in the past. And uh, well, what will be the role of the other entities if there is such a committee or such a central organ and uh, they will live by cooptation? The other thing is uh, you talk about fuzzy accountabilities. And when I later reread and reread the charter, because I had read it before I went to here, and. Uh, it didn't stick at my brain nerves, and I have the had the impression that many other people had the same uh, problem. Uh, fuzzy accountability. We have a long list of uh, what are the entities in the Wikipedia movement are accountable to. It's a long list without a hierarchy. Although for me, uh, for our chapter in the Netherlands, uh, there's uh, it's it's pretty much clear to who we are accountable. 
to our members' convention, that's the Dutch law. Mm -hmm. And then there's contractual law, we have uh, agreements with others, with the foundation. And uh, this, this, this list, and this list is also for, for the foundation and other entities, and you are introducing new kinds of ent uh, entities like Wikimedia partners and so on and so on. So I had, um, I afterwards realized that I believe those were the difficulties I had in understanding and conceptualizing this charter proposal. Okay. Maybe I'm not the only one. No, that is good to hear. I mean, gentleman at the back. No. I, mean, I can answer your question first, or I can take the gentleman's first, whichever is easier. I mean, the, the issue on the Olympics, I mean, I'm not trying to stand here and say the Olympics are a model you should follow them. I'm saying if you look at all the other ones, that's probably the one closest to where you want to get to. Uh, it is co-option, which is an issue to uh, address. Um, the reason I bring them up is they have hundreds of affiliates. So that they have way more affiliates than most of the other organizations. And the folks like MSF or Greenpeace are actually quite exclusive. You're either in or you're out. Yes, um, yes. Right, whereas I think one of the wonders of the wiki movement is the fact that it's very frictionless, very open, and people bring, them whole, bring their whole selves to wiki to do that. So the question is how to keep that going forward. Uh, and I think, strange as it may sound, the Olympics is probably one of the better ones. It's been able to be both open and coherent. But there's some other questions too. I saw some other hands go up. For some reason, uh, when I hear word accountable in Wikimedia context, it is like always very clear for me that it's accountable to community. I mean, all things should be accountable to community if they, for some very, very, very good reason, cannot be accountable to community. Uh, you should introduce somebody which will oversee like aud aud audit committee or something like that, but in most cases, it should be accountable to community uh, or and to readers in general. That's a common view. It's difficult to it's difficult to realize in practice. It which community do you mean, and how is the accountability recognized? I, so what I'll say is, I want us to break up now into groups so that we have 20 minutes for each group to discuss and to get into a, a little more detail. Uh, that's a great topic for the for the, the community group. Let's have community discussion here. Uh, actually, sorry, that's a, that's a great topic for the movement wide group because you assign that w that thing you're imagining to community. Other people might say that's something which every entity has to um, embody in their in their bylaws because it's those entities that have a process for uh, for realizing accountability. Uh, so let's have movement wide. A charter discussion here, recommendations to the community, like setting up dispute, uh, global dispute resolution and global request groups here, and uh, formal entities, and recommendations to the chapter, and recommendations for new models in the middle. I uh, yes, move around a little bit. I guess let's let's form a little circle in in the middle. James and I will uh, will be there in a minute. You can talk. Okay. Um, MR dash breakout dash organizations, spelt the British way. I had to tell someone. So, um, so what we were looking at were the organizational structures, and uh, what we were theoretically looking at was what are the rights of these organizations. Um, this is distinct from the existing chapter system that we have, and what should be the processes and the people involved in actually determining who gets to be a organization X, Y, or Z. Sorry, Z. So, um, unfortunately, or fortunately, and certainly this is really important learning, is that we got massively, massively bogged down in naming and in trying to actually work out this ontology of different groups. Um, so what does that group do? What does this group do? You had it right, and then you stopped it. Uh, <laughs> okay. Um, so, so we've come up with a new set of names that we don't think are any good, but we think are better than the ones we had before. Um, and, and in talking them through, it actually really helped kind of bring out the topics at hand. So 
Um, we, so right up front, we have the kind of names as it was used originally. So you have partner organizations, associations, and affiliates. And so there are those questions we wanted to ask. But we kind of recut that. We recut that and said, so you have these, these things we have already, these chapters. Let's, let's call that chapters or maybe national chapters. They, they ha have kind of a geographic scope. They're unique. You don't have more than one in per one geographic scope. And they're a formal organization. Then in the new section, you have still a formal organization, but it might not be unique because it doesn't necessarily cover a geographic area. It could cover uh, the whole of the globe. It could cover a specific area. But either way, it, it kind of interleaves with and is not the same as a, a national chapter. And so I kind of said, well, why don't we call them global chapters? So that's terms could be differed. Then you have these kind of informal organizations. And so we had kind of a bit of conversation about this. So what does it mean to be an informal organization? You know, so, so trademarks. You get to use trademarks. Oh, really? How much? In what contexts? Um, and we didn't really get into any, any depth in that. But there's kind of conversation that you'd need to have some kind of trademark issue so that people could kind of reuse it and kind of display, here's the Wikipedia logo. We're Wikipedians who love, you know, students of Haifa University who love Wikipedia would might be an informal group or something like that. And, and then this kind of affiliates thing that we didn't really like at the end. And then we said, oh, and of course, there's other kinds of partners, business partners. You know, if, we, if the foundation or some other organization signs a deal with Yahoo, that's you know, not one of these four groups. So anyway, it's confusing. In terms of process, uh, one of the things we looked at is this kind of suggestion that there might be an affiliations committee, um, distinct and separate from the existing chapters committee. And that did seem a bit odd to us, especially with the idea that the chapters committee could help an organization that was a chapter convert into an organization that wasn't a chapter and possibly going the other direction. Why wouldn't it also be the organization to determine what those other kind of bodies are? So there was kind of a suggestion that, SJ is helpfully editing for me, that um, we might want to have an affiliation committee or, um, that is actually merged with what is currently called chapters committee. And we have a new body called organization committee, committee committee, you know, answers on a postcard. Um, and then, you know, I kind of deliberately, radically suggested, well, how's, what's the membership of that? Is it just automatic? The chair of everybody that gets promoted gets to be on the chapter committee because that's what it is. It is the collection of all the existing chapters. It's the club that gets to say, you can join, you're like us. That's an option. We didn't like that, that, but that's an option. You know, there are a whole lot of different membership structure organizations for these kind of governance committees that we could come up with. And, um, and that's kind of where we left it, which is that it's a bit confused. We're not exactly sure how it works, and there's a lot to think about. But the names are important. Thanks, James. Did someone from the movement group want to reflect back? Doesn't have to be the same person who took notes. Anybody else want to read on? All right, two minutes. Um, apologies for not using the etherpad. Um, technologically inhibited here, or whatever the appropriate term is. Um, essentially, what we had was a good discussion of the draft charter, which is up there. Um, the, I mean, the good news is I think that most people thought it was useful. Uh, the folks in the group thought also it was actually pretty good in terms of direction and that what was there was not that controversial in the sense of, you know, we, we could get close to signing it. Then what everyone did feel was that there was a lot of work needed on drafting, and we had a lot of input on that. In particular, uh, there was some strong feedback that what we need to do is be much more specific about what is the shared mission, rather than just referring to it, uh, what are the shared values, and what are the shared principles. Um, right now, we're quite loose about this, and I think the feedback we got was we need to be very much more sharp about that, and adopt that from the appropriate sources and put that in writing. Um, another set of questions that came up, which I think may come up in the next discussion, were to one, to what extent should we have a process to arrive at priorities? Should that be in the charter, or if not, do we address it elsewhere? And the second issue that came up, which may be addressed elsewhere but needs to be addressed somewhere, is what happens if someone signs onto the charter and then does not adhere to it? So what is the steps that are taken, what is the process that happens if someone says, you know, I really agree with the mission statement, I've signed the piece of paper, then what they do doesn't fit with that. That's the two-minute summary of our discussion. Thank you. Any questions? Cool. Vishaka?
sorry. It's a roaming mic. The roaming mic is in the back. Test, test, test. Yeah, James, my question was, you know, the informal group where it says non-geographic, it's a little ambiguous to Sorry, me. Sorry, yeah. So does that mean, for instance, if there was an informal organization within a city or within a country, would that be considered? I gave the example for an informal group as London Wikimedians. Um, so, no, very specifically could have geographic scope, but it isn't constrained that it must have geographic scope. The same with the global chapters. You could have a global chapter being people who f are Irish, and that would cover Wikimedia UK territory, it would cover Wikimedia Republic of Ireland territory were it to get created, and it might theoretically also cover people of Irish descent in North America and Venezuela and everywhere else, or it might not, and that's up to them to decide when they create the organization. Any other questions whilst I'm standing up? Cool. And yes, we'll, we'll put examples in brackets. Bishaka, did you have one more? I had a question for John's group. So uh, my question was, did you all discuss in terms of groups that agree on the charter how do they signify their agreement? Uh, we, we did discuss that. Um, and, and the conclusion we came to was that we want eventually everyone to agree it. So at some point in the future, everyone will agree to the charter. But how will we know that groups have agreed to the charter? Okay, that that, that's a more <laughs> we discussed that one too. That's the more complicated question, right? Um, so there's, you, there's a number of ways to do it, and we didn't come to a conclusion on it. So one, will be, one way would be to say we want everyone to sign it in sequence by a certain date, and if you don't, there'll be something that happens. Another way would be to say over a period of time, we want everyone to adopt it as part of their agreements for being a chapter or being a group or being whatever. So yes, at some point, we want everyone to have formally adhered to them, but the actual process we debated but didn't, didn't conclude whether it should be immediate or over a period of time. Is that fair? No. And the last group? Community recommendations for the community? Stephen, were you going to talk about this? Yeah. All right. I can call it the etherpad if you want. So we talked a lot about the dispute resolution side of these things, and there was sort of this like general low-level consensus um, without details about, <laughs> when I say low-level, I mean like there are disagreements about the fuzzy details, not that people disagreed, um, on the fact that there needed to be some kind of body separate from the, thi some the things we have now for decision-making on things like disputes, global policies, you know, general like dispute resolution, behavioral issues, all of those things. Um, because right now the only people that make those decisions are either the random agglomeration of people on Meta who happen to show up or the stewards. And the stewards are really uncomfortable making those decisions because that's not what they're elected to do. They're really like a technical body, not a decision making body. Um, and then some of the open questions were like, well, well, that's really more of a to-do. That would, like the first thing to do is to like absolutely make clear its scope and provide like obvious use cases of things that have already happened. Um, one of the open questions was, do we have? And this, there's already some documentation about this on Meta. Like, do you have a body that's uh, each separate for each of those things? Something, to d someone to decide policy or a system for deciding policy stuff, and then dispute resolution and blocks and locks that kind of thing. Or do you combine all of those into one simple global, ARBCOM wiki council thing? Um, 
And then a separate thing we talked about a lot was in terms of like connecting other language communities, just ensuring that there's real global consensus for this kind of policy and this kind of like uh, governing body, um, that just sticking it on meta and saying, oh, well, there was a comment period and now the comment period is over, I'm sorry, is not even close to good enough, that there needs to be some kind of like basic soliciting of people's feedback from other language communities, even if it's just village pump notices or something like that. Um, and then, uh, that, that there needed to be generally a higher level of like trust and conversation between the different communities in order for something like this to really happen. Um, and then the last one was that, that when it comes to like the handful of use cases that, we, that were brought up, that privacy of evidence is usually a really big issue because, I mean, not in just a, a legal sense, but in a like just ethical sense, because it usually involves people's privately, per personally identifiable information, both Wikimedians and not Wikimedians. Um, so there may have be have to be some kind of like private space and basic level of trust in that governing body to, you know, make decisions based on private evidence. So that's that's what we talked about. He he was torn away. Okay. He had he had a, an urgent phone call. Thanks a lot. Were there any questions for Stephen in the community group? So the last the last group of, of hard questions that we didn't raise particularly were about transparency and accountability. Uh, let's take a five minute break and then Stu, I'll, I'll ask you up to, to talk about it. This is for a, a lightning talk and, and take questions. Sound good? And I, I'll just remind people, uh, thanks for all the, all the collaboration on those topics. Please, uh, if you have not yet answered this set of questions, please take a look at the list of feedback questions. Uh, movement role slash feedback on meta and uh, and please answer them or if there's someone particularly opinionated and who's interested in these things in one of the in one of your groups or chapters make sure that someone from your from your organization answers them thanks so much all right five minute bio break you are on this is a lightning talk before everyone gets to go out and party in the yard do you want a mic All right, we'll see if the battery lasts. So yeah, so I got a, a question at the, uh, at the board Q&A, and I thought it might be interesting to spend a little bit more time for people who are interested in hearing about some of these questions around kind of uh, the fundraising process, how it's set up, what some of the differences are within it, and how all of that ties into the theme of accountability in our movement. So I did a blog post about this a week or two ago, um, which there's been a little bit of discussion around. Um, and I'll just do three or four minutes, and then we can take yeah, then we can take some uh, some questions. You know, I think you know at a high level, the the key question is how as a movement do we drive as much accountability and transparency as possible? And in particular, how does we as a movement manage donor funds? So we're very fortunate. We've got thirty million dollars that were given to our movement over the course of the past year. And we really have a duty, a moral duty. You know, the foundation actually has what's called a fiduciary duty in the U.S. to make sure that that money goes uh, for the best possible use in pursuit of our mission. And, you know, there's one aspect of our fundraising model in which I think there's been some challenges around this issue. And that is that um, one of the things we do is direct money straight to chapters. So certain chapters, the, the, some that are at one particular point in their development, can receive funds directly through the fundraiser. Um, there aren't any sort of centralized financial controls over these. There aren't any centralized requirements about how the money will be spent or where it will go. There's no centralized evaluation process to ensure they're being spent in the best possible way. And I think that's created some challenges as we as an audit committee, and I'm uh, chair of the audit committee, which has a bunch of community members on it, and. You know, that's one of the things which we in the audit committee have struggled with over the past really about two years as this model was put in place. And we spent a lot of time talking with our, our outside auditors. We use a big firm called KPMG, 
We've actually brought in some other people as well to help us look at this question. Um, and you know, as, as I sort of highlighted in the, in the blog post, I think there definitely are some issues around this model. Um, and what, what we're trying to do, and the board spent a fair bit of time on this over the last two days, if you've seen us huddling in corners in various spots around the, the hotel or we're here, you know, one of the things we're really trying to do is think through this question and, and think through the challenge of, of how we can bring kind of cohesive controls and, and oversight to So, so one of the things that we've been trying to do is really in our own heads on the board articulate what the real principles are and then start to think about you know, what changes might need to happen in order for us to bring our fundraising practices in line with those principles. Um, and I'm just going to rattle through a few of them, which again, some of which are in the blog and some of which we've been, we've been kicking around. I think that the biggest one is the decentralization is key. And I said this earlier today, right? Having a decentralized model where lots of volunteers and lots of organizations and lots of entities can help drive our movement is critical to success. It's why we've done uh, the amazing things we've all been able to do so far. So we've got to find a way to support decentralization uh, and help it flourish. I think that's really, uh, really important. Um, I think another principle though is that as the foundation and certainly as the audit committee members of the foundation, you know, we've got an obligation to oversee every dollar that someone gives to our movement, right? Because fundamentally, uh, if, a, if a donation comes in through one of the websites uh, that we operate, Wikipedia, you know, Wiktionary, whatever, even if right now that money ends up going directly to a chapter that participates as a payment processor, I think we as a foundation still feel like we have an obligation to help ensure that that, that money is getting spent well. And I think that's actually very consistent with our fiduciary duty in the US uh, as a nonprofit. Um, you know, I th we, we thought about some of the different criteria that might make <laughs> sense. Um, you know, you've got very well established chapters that have lots of, have an audit committee and lots of financial controls and are doing great, a great job of reporting and transparency. And, you know, the objective is to try and see how can we, you know, get everyone to the point where they can meet, you know, some set of criteria that's going to give us this set of controls. So, I feel like I'm rambling a little bit and maybe I'll just turn it open to questions and we've got a bunch of the different board members here and we can talk about that. Um, because I think it's a really important issue, but more, most importantly, it's a really hard issue. Like, I don't know what the right answer is in terms of managing this tension between the glories of decentralization and the reality is that when you have $30 million flowing through your movement every year, you have to have some financial controls and you have to have some consistent application of financial controls and transparency. And that's a real struggle. And I think it's something which is a new problem for us. Uh, and it's one that we're gonna have to evolve our model to manage as we continue to have the success raising money. Questions, just to jump in. Well, I, I think that's great, you know, and I totally agree with you. And, you know, one point I'd make is over the past year or two, certainly my sense is the foundation's made huge strides in reporting on its activities, right? There are now extremely lengthy monthly reports put out by Sue and her staff that cover, you know, nearly every aspect of what the foundation is doing from every new hire, from many departures, major program spending, reports on performance against key metrics. like I. In principle, I absolutely agree with you, but I will say fairly definitively that right now the foundation is doing a better job of transparency and reporting on its activities, certainly than it's ever done in the past, and quite possibly better than any other part of our movement. Um, and when it comes to money, you do publish a 30-day guide. 
Right, exactly. Right, we publish month, month. Phoebe's just saying that when it comes to, in particular to finances, you know, we publish detailed audited financials each year. We do mid-year financial updates. We do monthly reports on revenues and expenses and the, you know, operating reserve that might be created from them. So in principle, you're absolutely right. There's no special treatment that the foundation or chapters get. It's the same bar we're all trying to reach to. Um, and I just think at the moment, the foundation is probably further ahead, but that's what you'd expect. It's a 10, nine-year-old, eight-and-a-half-year-old organization. It's had the opportunity to really develop a lot of those practices, so it should be better. Absolutely, right. I think the question is, should we have tiered expectations for chapters based on their maturity and size? And of course, that's the right answer. And I think, wh while, what time? Uh, well, exactly. And, you know, the, the, I think the challenge, though, is that money, that there's certain areas where we can kind of tier expectations. But in the end, the introduction of a lot of money eliminates some ability to do that. Right, there's a point in, and financial people call it materiality. There's a point of materiality in the amount of money that might be flowing to an organization. So if an organization's getting five or $10,000, it's probably not enough that you need to worry about it a lot. But any organization that's getting a material amount, it's gonna have to live up to that bar. And I think that's a little bit of the challenge. So you're absolutely right, tiering is critical. Um, it's just, you don't have a lot of flexibility given the amounts of money that are flowing around now. Right? We're so fortunate in fundraising, but you don't have a lot of flexibility once you hit a certain bar in terms of how much money is, is going to or floating around an organization. Uh, Ada? Mm. Yeah, no, I, 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 th I think that's a really important point. And, you know, the way I think about it is, you know, the, the concept of a 50-50 split with a chapter that's acting as a payment processor, which is kind of what we call the role where they get cash directly, a year or two ago was a convenient simplifying assumption. You know, I'm, I don't think it was wrong. It was a fine idea at the time. You know, but since then, a lot has happened, right? As a whole group, we all, this whole movement, put together this amazing strategic plan that actually spelled out in rather excruciating detail kind of what our priorities are and where we should make investments. And I think that's, to me, that concept of the prioritization that we all went through really makes the whole idea of a fixed split kind of uh, archaic, 
right? The idea of a fixed split doesn't really make sense anymore because we have a set of priorities that we've agreed to and that make sense. And yeah, there's some great, you know, there's some issues around global north and global south and opportunities to do things like you've described with, you know, diaspora communities editing their Wikipedias. So, so yeah, I think that's a great point and I totally agree with it. And again, a fixed split was an easy, convenient assumption when we didn't have really clear plans and priorities, but now we do and, and we should kind of embrace those. Exactly, and that's the right model. Yeah, no, and I, and, I, and I think the question is, as the amount of money has grown, are the changes we've talked about so far enough to address the regulatory and auditing and financial control issues? And I think that's the big question, and I think that's what we've been you know, iterating on and spending a lot of time with Barry and, and a bunch of the chapters people negotiating all the, the chapters agreements is to try and understand if it's enough or whether we need to do more. Well, but, but so let me ask you that question. A communication issue is easy. Why hasn't it been fixed? Because Pick up the phone, send an email, go to someone's website. Like, I, I'm, really, I'm really curious to hear the answer because what you've described is the yeah. easiest possible thing to fix. Wow. Uh, 
Yeah. Well, so, so, so at the end, you, you end reading like long, long stuff. Yeah. But skipping some time information, so you don't get the big picture. And maybe there is yeah. an overview of the global meeting. Right. And this is the last thing I have. So, Christophe, I heard, I mean, this sort of, sort of proves our point, not the long email, yeah. but the, the other kind. Um, I heard a few people say they're confused about the reporting schedule and the fundraising yeah. agreement, why there's 12 reports. That's why. So that's why I think it's right. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. I think we have time for one more question. Well, what I was wondering about, you, you have two quite separate issues raised in the blog post, because one is on what are you spending on. Mm -hmm. Of course, if you say that it's wonderful that we have by a broad process reached an agreement on spending yeah. this money, then it should be possible by means of the same process or something somewhat more simplified, at least with the major chapters where the most money is coming in, also to reach an agreement about the way you spend the money. So that would not be a real problem with making, uh, with having a decentralized approach, because of course we share these values. Right. I have no doubt that if the object is there need to be done things in the South, we would have no problem convincing our uh, uh, membership meeting to do so. But the difficult part is that you say, well, we cannot leave, there's not two chapters, so let's yeah. take it away from them, that responsibility. That's the wrong way, because then you reduce the responsibility even right. of people within a chapter to think about these matters. And the other part is, is yeah. the accountability. Right. The, the remark was made about fair tier system. I think that would be the response, the, the correct response, even from a financial point of view. Right. It would be highly illogic for small amounts of money, chapters dealing only with limited yeah. To have this huge overhead of yeah. obligations. And on yeah. the other hand, if the money becomes a lot, well, of course, corresponding rules which you have to obey uh, should be increased too. It's logic. Yeah. No, I think that's exactly right. And those are really the two issues, which is one, particularly near and dear to the audit committee's heart financial controls, accountability, transparency, right? Those principles that are so important both in our movement and in financials. But then how funds get allocated and are we actually spending money consistent with our strategic plan? And, and I think the, in a decentralized model, the challenge is how you tie everything together um, while respecting each of the different groups and entities within the movement, but at the same time having a process to tie it all together. And that's hard. That's very hard. Um, and you know, I think we've, we've been trying something with kind of direct participation as payment processors, and I think in some ways that's worked, and in some ways it hasn't worked. And so, you know, it's been a really good and informative lesson. And so the trick is to, f again, figure out how we can tie it all together, and how we can tie it all together while respecting each entity. And uh, I think we're going to all figure that out uh, together. Okay. Great. If anybody, I'm around next couple of days, um, so feel free to talk and, uh, and ask more questions. I take some notes which I'll uh, which I'll capture on Meta.
Thanks, everyone. Awesome. And thank you, Stu.